I put it in there. <laughs> that shit's true. <laughs> Welcome into the latest edition of Hot Tag Wrestle Corner. I'm one half of your host. I am Rob. I'm Clint. And uh, first, before we get to laughing, let's bring it down a little bit. We got to add somebody into the gangster lane. That's more of a background player with a su- part of a super famous family in the annals of professional wrestling. Uh, Mr. Jackie Crockett has passed. Um, we want to talk a little bit about Jackie. If you don't know, he ran the camera in the WJCP days of Jim Crocker promotions and then WCW in their heydays through the 90s and NWA, uh, NWO era and 83 weeks era, so on and so forth from there. Um, a little bit about Mr. Crockett. Uh, he passed away. Uh, His actual name is Charles Jackson, Jackie Crockett, passed away um, on the 13th, the same night as um, Big Business earlier this week on Wednesday. After spending a month in the hospital, he was the lead cameraman for Jim Crocker Promotions and then worked for WCW until the very last Nitro. Uh, He had a good relationship with many talents that he worked with. Uh, his brother, David Crockett, is quoted as saying, quote, it's been a long journey for Jackie, and he went on his way. Tonight, Jackie's breathing was heavy and labored, and when we thought he was gone, he would come back like a wrestling false finish. <laughs> I don't think this is the time to add wrestling into this type of thing, but maybe you just want to add some levity to the situation. So, however you grieve, sir. Um, a little bit more about him is uh, Scott Hudson, who was a former WCW announcer, around Tony Schiavone and Mike Tanay, and he was part of the Mark Madden days, so later 98, 99 days at WCW, the last dying days of it. Um, he had some quotes about it. He said, quote, Jackie was strictly a live event cameraman. He was never in the studio. He was always on the road. When I first went on the road to do television at my first night, Jackie introduced himself to me. He was always the nicest guy in the building. Always looked like he was about to crack up as someone was joking. No one else had heard. And when he introduced himself, he said, and my family used to own this company. And I said, so your last name's Turner. <laughs> he popped up and I popped. Uh, He popped and I popped, I'm sorry. So I told him, of course, I knew who he was, and it was an honor to work with him. We became fast friends after. Uh, If there was, in how you could say, an appropriate camera angle to be had of something at ringside or in the crowd, Jackie would shoot it and then look at us and wink and say, I got that. Uh, It was one of the highlights of working at WCW, R.I.P. Jackie Crockett. Also from here at the show, we would like to say R.I.P. Jackie Crockett. And um, condolences to his family and friends. All right, real quick. Now, moving on with our show. Got the sad stuff out the way. No more sad news bears here on the show. Let's jump right into the news. We also have a Mount Rushmore. Since today is National 316 Day. Uh, we have seven instead of both having four, which would make eight because we both have our number one is going to be the same, obvious for obvious reasons. We'll get into that in a little bit. But our Mount Rushmore is Stone Cold promos, this time with play along, just like when we did the worst wrestling songs of all time. So uh, we decided to bring back another reason to <laughs> tap into the annals of some samples, uh, some Stone Cold. So we'll throw those on for you in a second. Also, um, we got our news this week, we got our TV show reviews this week and we also got the second episode of dark side of the ring that happened this week it's a life and times of buff Bagwell, which i found simply hilarious because he just could not stop getting in his own fucking way and there are many stories that highlighted that were highlighted in this episode um i have a couple that i want to point out <laughs> so i'll take the lead on this one this week when we get there uh but for now let's start off in the news and i would say the biggest news of the week would have to be the debut of mercedes monet in aew in so many ways this has been a very impactful um debut 
Let's start off first of all with how much she'll be earning as a story. Now, this has become a story because that I'm gonna read it. It's best previously reported. Um, Mercedes Monet made her debut this week. We were saying the Wrestling Observer newsletter had updated how much money she'll be earning in the company when she negotiated with WWE in late 2022 to late 2023. She wanted more money than the company was offering. There were reports at the time that she was looking to get paid like Becky Lynch level money, which why can't she? As currently, I could be wrong because you're a Becky Lynch person, so you tell me. Are their accolades the same in that company, or has Sasha had more? I think the main thing with Sasha was it wasn't the talent. I think it was just more the fact that like the injuries. She always was true. Hurt. true. I think they probably looked like they don't. They didn't want to tie like probably like that much money into like. Which I understand. Like you don't want to tie that much money to somebody who you feel injured. But I mean, but when Sasha Banks is on. She's on. <laughs> yeah, very She's true. on. Yeah, exactly. You know, but I, I, I understand it, though. Uh, so, I, do I wish they would have paid? I wish they would have paid Sasha Banks. Banks, but, I mean, they didn't, and good for her. Um, you know, I'm happy for her. I like the boss. It's unknown what AEW's offer was, except that it was higher than WWE's. However, it's considerably lower than the five million that has been rumored online. A female star in WWE did note that when she heard it was enough to make Monet, the highest paid woman in wrestling. She did say that they're happy that AEW made that offer and she accepted. And that meant it, it will mean more for other women's wrestlers. They added, quote, I think it sets the standard that women should be paid, too. The women do great numbers. They have huge social followings. It's a huge deal for women in the industry who are paid a lot less than the men are. So she's like, it's kind of like the NFL. She's setting the, she bar, the bar for her for her division or her position, I should say. Yeah. So yeah, she she deserves it. <clears throat> also, too, I think it also helps out. Not like other women like they kind of like you go to like I don't know how New Japan and them do it with like how they pay stardom wrestlers and stuff. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure either. But I mean, I look at it like now, say you got some of that talent that's coming over. You know, say Vince, you got Julia coming over. But that's probably already set in stone. So I'm probably gonna go with. Probably if you go with you, Tommy Hashishka. Probably she was at the performance center under uh, with Eo Scott, right? Eo Scott. Mm -hmm. So she's one of the best wrestlers over in Japan, you know. So she, you, she could command top money, you know. Somebody like her, somebody like Suri, or you want to go to Young Rock, you can go to somebody like Azuni or Starlight Kid. Like they're both like they both ain't even twenty six yet. Julia's twenty six. <laughs> like. And I decided, I want to say Sasha, like. Sasha's 32. 32. Yeah, see? So, like, that's, that's they in the prime. Uh, there wasn't that right now. That's the time to take advantage of it. So. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy for Sasha. She did set the market. And I'm glad that she did set it because it's these wrestlers out here, they main event shows. Now they're main event pay per views now. It ain't how it was back when you had Braun Payne matches every week or you had to scrap to get a five minute match. They, like, I remember at the WrestleMania, they did like an eight woman tag match in like two minutes. Like, how do you even do that? <laughs> do that. Like, do that. Like, they don't give them no time. So it's like, I'm happy that it got better. Props to the women. They deserve it. They bust their ass. And you look at some of the best in the game. You look at Sasha Banks. You look at Julia. You go look at the Rhea Ripley's and the big. Rhea Ripley, another one. Mm -hmm. Rhea Ripley, all like 20. Five, she know that could come in with her when it's time for her. Oh, she's the perfect person that's going to look at like, oh, y'all see what they gave Sasha? Yeah, y'all got to give me close to that. Possibly more. <laughs> more. Like, so she set the market. So she was also interviewed um, um, for some backstage digital exclusive content posted by AEW with Renee Paquette. Uh, she says on her time between WWE and AEW, quote, at first it was just finding a team, finding people that I can get to help me because I felt so lost, so broken, so hurt, and so confused. Not knowing where I fit in in this world, especially in the world of wrestling, gave me so much hope, gave me so many dreams, gave me so much opportunity. I felt very lost and confused and unsure, and it hurt me because of how much work I had put in and being in the wrestling and in all my dreams and into it. And all my dreams into it just felt like it got taken away from me and just kind of came crumbling down. <clears throat> Excuse me. On finding herself, quote, it took a little bit of healing, a lot of healing. But a team to really help me build back up 
and have my back to let me know I am more than a boss. I am a CEO because I took control of my own life. I walked out with my head held high and I found so many new passions that I never got to discover before. Wrestling has always been one of those and my one and only in my everything to be 30 back then and now i'm 32 to grow and understand that there's so much more than this wrestling is so much more it's so beautiful it's more than just the ring she continued it's to be discovering a new love a new foundation and just a new everything it just felt it just felt so freeing to grow uh also there's a uh, they say that AEW and Warner Brothers Discovery negotiations are likely to begin soon, but they're already 75% complete from what we hear. Um, it's, it's said to be in a higher priority, just like it was with them signing the, uh, the, the NBA deal a couple months back. So we'll see where this goes and have updates on that as it moves on. Darby Allen suffered a broken foot on AEW this week. That was not a work. That was shoot. And after he's talking for months about climbing Mount Everest, he has to put that off again, <laughs> which has to fucking suck for him. I bet. I bet. And he said, he like, I think in this tweet, he was like, guess I have to do it again next year. He's really helping on climbing Mount Everest. Like, uh, about for a while side track. Yeah, that's literally, what, that's literally what he said. Well, I literally was sidetracked. Uh, wait, no. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so. What should we start off with? Good. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, let's start with the, the, one, the first news that got me. That was through the course of this week. Miro and CJ Perry, who formerly known as Lana, has split. Their marriage reportedly ended late in 2023. Uh, even though Mary was on social media posting about visiting her in the hospital as she suffered a severe infection that required multiple surgeries, almost cost her her arm. Arm, they was on and off again, and simply for years, simply, they, they basically, they just drifted apart, basically. Like, you know what I mean? He probably was in AEW. Uh, being a uh, fear of God, she's getting put through tables by Nia Jax on a constant weekly basis. <laughs> basis. Uh, Perry, the one that confirmed the split, she also made a statement. She said, Mero and I have made the difficult decision to separate after many wonderful years together and have decided to move on as friends and hopefully on-screen characters somewhere down the road. They had yet to officially file for a divorce. Divorce, but Mero has moved back to uh, Bulgaria and... He has been absent from promotion since World End, where he defeated your boy, El Idolo. And when Perry aligned with her husband on screen. So, with his extended absence, his future is unclear. But the company do have performers who live overseas. They do a thing to have and travel to a venue. Well, Osprey does, Okada still does. Leaving the door for him to potentially continue working in uh, AEW. So, that That's, sucks. Yeah. I tell you something else that sucks. So we're talking about sad news bears over here. Angela Dawkins has revealed that his mom has passed away. Uh, in a post he put on X this week, he said he's still trying to process it, but he's still in disbelief. Rest easy, mom. I love you. Enjoy heaven, fam. Man. So rest in peace to Angela Dawkins' mom. Unfortunately, here in, in this article, it does not have her actual like name, so we can give her some more love. Um, no, that's safe for the buff stuff. Okay, uh, I got a couple I can get into. Go ahead. Oh, uh, Matt Hardy still hasn't reached a deal with AEW, and he has himself has said he has no plan of retiring anytime soon. Now, do this possibly stem from the fact that he has been on his radio show and he has been critical of how AEW has been booking him? And his brother, his frustrations about how he's been utilized. Uh, the whole thing with Jeff, uh, concussion. Was it concussion? I think concussion. No, broken nose. Mm hmm. Broken nose. So, I don't know, there, Matt. I don't know if I agree, bro. It's like, it's not like y'all been doing the best work when you're on TV 
And then he's had his own personal demons. He's had to get over it. He's constantly out for it. And he comes back, and now he's out with injury. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's a process. I feel him for your frustration, but I also can see kind of their side of it, too. <laughs> so, I don't know. But I hope the best for you, though, Matt. Yeah. Uh, also, Cleveland has officially got SummerSlam. August 3rd. It would be the first time since 1996. That's the last time something had a SummerSlam. Mm -hmm. That 96. You had that in 96. That like was all uh, Star Weekend. That was Mankind Undertaker mm -hmm. Boiler Room. Uh, yeah. that, all, that was also Shawn Michaels Vader. Yeah. So, uh, basically, uh, it's going to be at Clinton Brown Stadium. So, in August, which, you know, uh, get the statement here. Here we go. WWE released a statement. I ain't about to read the whole statement. WWE will take over the city of Cleveland for stack schedule throughout the week, including Friday Night Smackdown from Rocky Mortgage Fieldhouse on August 2nd, and a variety of fan community events on the days leading up to and after SummerSlam. Cleveland is the home to several WWE superstars, including Logan Paul, The Miz, Johnny Gargano. Why did they mention Logan Paul? That nigga don't give a fuck. It was on his show. That's, but, but he don't I, care, bro. You live in L.A. The Miz cares more than you, and he live in L.A. too. Yeah. Johnny Gargano cares more, just as more as you do. He don't live here either, but he seems to care more than both of them. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the city of Cleveland has a rich... The city of Cleveland and WWE have a rich history that spanned decades. This is said by Triple H. We are excited to bring SummerSlam and SmackDown a full slate of events to a town in a partnership with Hasman Sports Group and the Greater Cleveland Sports Commission. Commission. He talks about how it further strengthened Cleveland's grown reputation as a premier city uh, to host major events in the U.S. That was said by Dan Gilbert. Uh, this will be the largest event ever hosted in Ohio and it will bring economic impact to the community and it highlights Cleveland's vibrant downtown experiences and exciting attractions. Attractions. So, so that just mean like as far as the amount of people are going to be at it, right? Hmm. I'm like we've had we've won championships. I think those are bigger than a SummerSlam. Now I didn't have as many people that per game though, so that's where I'm thinking like maybe they just mean the. the I think they talking about like actual like event like right. like paying event. I think with that. Speaking of Big Four, play. speaking of Big Four, Minnesota submits their bid to host WrestleMania 41 next year. Quote. Uh, we do have a third event we are almost ready to announce. I hope that we would be able to announce it today, but we can't quite yet. Hopefully, we'll provide the news on that in the next few weeks. This event will provide economic impact second to only the Super Bowl. Hmm. So, we'll see. That was Minnesota's uh, House of Representatives where that uh, statement was made. Um, Conan critiques how AEW has utilized CMLL stars. Is that our Saudi bitch story? Yep, Saudi bitch story of the week. We're gonna save that one. Okay. We save all the funny Saudi bitch stories for last. Okay, all right. How we do it. We'll come I'll back to it. A couple more. That's all right. I think I know where that intertwine with each other. Leah might be a is going to the WWE Hall of Fame. Her name is being thrown around as an inductee into the 2024 Hall of Fame. According to Dave Meltzer, she will be joining the club, which includes Paul Heyman, the U.S. Express, Bull Nagamo, Muhammad Ali, and Thunderbolt Patterson. Patterson, she was a famous promoter who took over Polynesian Pro Wrestling in 1982. She is the wife of Peter Maivia, the grandfather to Dwayne and Rock Johnson. She passed away in 2008 at the age of 77. Well, you took my other one I was going to say. They put it in there with the story. I it's all right, because I got one that wasn't in there. Did you have Muhammad Ali on there? Because he's also being inducted. Yes, they mentioned Muhammad Ali. Okay, gotcha. All right, well, then I'll skip this. Uh, more story, uh... Shayna Baszler is going to be allowed to uh, to work GC Josh Barnett GCW Bloodsport X show, uh, which will happen during WrestleMania weekend in Philadelphia. Uh, he has made a decision to allow her to work the event along with uh, <coughs> WWE time working in the event duty and other. He has reportedly made a decision to allow her to work the event along with other WWE talent working in the event dates dates uh apparently the uh he has a different view of data e time working indie shows than vince did again certain indie shows ain't he ain't gonna be doing no wrestling candles like mm. nothing like that but like 
At least he let them like go out and do other indie shows though. But you should, cause you got a lot of brothers that came from the indies. So Looking you know that only you know, probably gonna be there. He's there yeah, but I bet you she goes over in that match. He ain't gonna allow the people to use the town for him to go lose. I don't know who she's facing in that match. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, down to my last couple stories here. I only got two left. Um, so first being, Will Ospreay said WWE is not for me. AEW made a better offer. Uh, in an interview we had on Talk of Jericho earlier this week, he was quoted as saying where he wanted to be, quote, man, the thing was, I wanted to be in the UK. I know I'm not going to be exactly comfortable moving to another country. I moved to Japan in 2019, and as much as I loved it, it wasn't home. I entered a new relationship with my new missus who wrestles under the name Alex Windsor. Uh, I have a stepson now, and, uh, she just started school. Uh, I know... Well, if you know her story and everything she's been through, the UK scene kind of knows it, but she lost her husband and having to pick herself up after that and having to be a mom, a single mom, uh, to losing her husband. It's going to have to take a toll on you, and she needs to be around family and friends in that tight social circle. I couldn't bear the thought of moving her away from all of that and having her on her own once again. For me, the main priority was to stay in the UK, also wanting to be... Also one, wanting to up the wrestling because I have done everything in New Japan. I completed it. Uh, the viable option was I was happy. The viable option was where I was happy and what I was doing. Every time I came to AEW, Tony made me feel so comfortable and has given me nothing but trust and respect from the moment I came here. It was the right decision for me, and I'm happy here and looking forward to the challenges moving forward. It was the right decision. On the offer from WWE, quote, yeah, of course, it was... Uh, it was night and day, even in the difference on what they were offering from what AEW was offering. AEW was way better. The scheduling, everything about AEW was completely right option for me. It was always, you can go be a superstar in WWE and be famous, and it's not as good of pay, and it's not as kind of a schedule. I respect everyone there that's doing it, but it was just not for me. End quote. That's family so. I love how he said it, too, because he didn't shit on anybody. He said, I respect everybody that can do it. It just went for me. Yeah. Uh, a respectful way to say it too. I mean, like, yeah, they already w like you said. You can go and he can go. Like I said, guys like him and Okada, they ain't done in Japan. They may not be with them no more, but mm -hmm. they're gonna be going back over to Japan. And so, and you're right. The schedule, uh, I, actually, AW might be a better schedule for Will Ospreay. Much turp, much trauma he put his neck through that he scared it might not be good for him <laughs> for him um <laughs> tony khan teases a return for Britt baker d m d no time i miss Britt. she was one of your four pillars yes yeah, she is <laughs> so uh during south by south uh south by southwest 2024 disrupting the long Monopolized pro wrestling industry, AEW president and CEO Tony Khan teased that Dr. Britt Baker might be making her return soon. He said the following to fight for quote, she was out injured for a while and now she's out and about. She could be coming back soon. You never know when she could return. One of those things we have to we have up on our we have up our sleeves and it's always fun. We can do those. Um, Britt Baker and Daniel um, Brian Danielson took part in a Monday's panel. Dr. Baker has been out of action since September 2023 due to injury. More on this from her own words. Uh, she can't wait to get back into the ring. Uh, she was saying on this panel, the former AEW Women's Champion hasn't wrestled, as I said, since September 2023, when she lost to Chris Statlander in an a, a, uh, AEW TBS title bout. Quote, yeah, I do. Just growing as a wrestler and performer and learning what works and what doesn't work. With all the new talent coming in and new talent I get to work with and new coaches and new people coming over from WWE, new brains and minds we get to pick. You're really doing yourself a huge disservice if you're not constantly asking everybody around you for help. And help in AEW is growing and growing. For me personally, I can't wait to get back in the ring, have a mic in my hand and cut some promos. Stay tuned. I need you and Skiv on to get back together and do something. First person you got to see is your best friend, Tony. Do you do you got any more news? I only got one more story left. Yeah, I got uh, two more. Uh, Go ahead. Do yours, and then we'll get to one, the call, man. Uh, yeah, actually, my second last story actually pertains to that. So, ironic at that. Uh, Marvin Jackson's lawsuit against WWE reported <laughs> claims that he... <laughs> reported claims that he was... Uh, Injured at WrestleMania 38, just the whole thing with the pyro, do a pyro 
doing pyroblast. We all know pyro through Cody Rose. He's the only one that probably used pyro like that. It hurt you. <laughs> uh, has been sent back to arbitration. Uh, he had filed a lawsuit against WWE in January 20, January 2023, alleging a hearing of loss of hearing in his left ear during the event, during the pyroblast. They just missed the lawsuit with prejudice, meaning Jackson can't revive it in the same court. But despite filing the appeal, he was advised to pursue arbitration for damages. He's suing for over $1 million in <laughs> These prices, man. In monetary relief include damages, penalties, cost expenses, prejudgment, interest, attorney fees through a jury trial. Uh, the United States appealed the court recently upheld a decision by uh, the District Court of Tarrant County, Texas, Point J.D. argument that any disputes related to Jackson claim must be resolved through arbitration. So between him and that Anthony Dwayne Wilson, I mean, them guys trying to get the bag. Well, one trying to get 250 million. He just like, I just want a million. <laughs> uh, and my last story, uh, since it ties to yours, uh, take the wrong one. Hold on, click the wrong one again. God dang it. Sorry about that. Uh, Tony Khan has met with Stardom President and he's expecting Stardom and CMLL to be part of Forbidden Door. Door. Uh, they both will be part of Forbidden Door this year. It's a joint show with AEW and New Japan. He shared a photo of him and Stardom President uh, Taro Okada before AEW Big Business. Melson confirmed that the two had a meeting about working together and that Stardom wrestlers will probably be at Forbidden Door. He noted that this will be leading to a match between uh, Mina Shakawawa versus Honor J in the ring of Honor taping. But he also su suggests that wrestlers could be at ROA Supercard of Honor, including Azuni, which, you know, I love me some Azuni. That's one of my favorite wrestlers. Watch the match with her and Starlight Kid, bro. They're like awesome. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like Ricochet and. It's like Osprey Ricochet with Steamboat Savage, bro. It's like it's just it's just fast paced. So it they go so fast. Fast. Uh he also suggests that uh his tweet about Rafi uh, Agawa basically was just him showing loyalty to the promotion and to the new leadership. Leadership. Uh so that's my last news story. Alright. Until we get into the dark side. I bring that, them all after. That's that's it's it's oh it's coming quickly, it's coming quickly. We're gonna get through this in Mount Rushmore next. But here's my last story though. Uh, Conan on his Keep 100 podcast critiques how AEW has utilized stars from the CMLL. Uh, let's get right into his quotes. Quote: They the CMLL came in. Nobody knew who they were. They were standing or sitting in the audience. John Moxley made fun of them or whatever when he uh went to the corner. Uh, so now a match is made with no backstory, nothing. Then they have two matches in their uh, BCC already uh, wrestling FTR. Two matches that meant nothing. Did nothing for anybody, right? Really nothing. Uh, then they bring this kid in, Atlantis Jr. Nobody knows who the fuck it is. No, you just mad because all your people lost their matches. <coughs> Actually, not often did Mystical one last week. Okay. So that's one I could think well, of. Probably... And I feel him on none of them having a story build, but some of them came in that great matches. Hatcher Cheryl made a motherfucking yeah. spectacle of himself. And I'm not saying in a bad way, I'm saying in a wonderful way in this match against Danielson. Um, for example. I could kind of feel where he's coming from, but at the same time, I look at it as as AEW is the higher of the two companies and they're trying to give y'all some exposure. Did you expect like all this build and it was going for two months and be this feud that was going to end on the pay per view? Because if all you right. did, I think you were extremely delusional on where this is supposed to be going, bro. <laughs> like, what the fuck were you thinking? Like, come on, man. They had their own like, they, 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 angle. Yeah, <laughs> like, they, exactly. All you got is come in here and they just run through AEW, AEW. Right, and all like, like bro, like, like they, they, got they, match. they got their own stuff on their dockets they're going to worry about first, let alone trying to get your guys tied in on the show. So, like, I would say be grateful and shut the fuck up. Hey, no, I feel you. Was WWE doing this for you? And if they did, they got shat on even worse over there. So... 
I don't know. Especially under Vince, because you know Vince don't like Vince would just throw them all on 205 Live. <laughs> <laughs> if they if they would have came over and got more wins and tables are all ways, then you complain about how they weren't getting enough um the TV time. Yeah, it's because like, don't nobody really be watching ROH. Yeah, right. No, ain't nothing really gonna make you happy. I just think he felt right. like I honestly think he just felt like they it, it should have been like the invasion angle. His guy should have came in there, got pushed to the moon, go over a couple of people. But they put on great matches. I mean, they put on great matches. I mean. I don't know what you really expect to go into it. Not to yeah, mention, you also have a language barrier that's also going to help with that because this cat can't speak English. So that's not going to help here in America either. If you had a mouthpiece for him, I guess, but you going to have Alex Abrahantes uh, not for a whole crew of cats from MCLL. That that guy. <laughs> that guy be all over the goddamn place. I'm just saying, though. <laughs> he be all over the I know. He be uh, all over the place, though. I'm just saying, uh, bro, though. I, I, mean, I would assume it would be I Alex Abrahantes. Like, I'm assuming he would be the be, one. Yeah. I'm like, like, anytime, 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 anytime it's Commander, Penta, Ray Phoenix. He's he there. <laughs> What's the common denominator? Spanish wrestler. Yeah. We see him like 80. Yeah. We see him a lot. <laughs> just, just being real on that one. All right. So today's date in the year of our Lord 2024 is National Stone Cold Day because the date is 316. You can get permission to drink all the beer you want. I'm going to go give me a fat-ass can of beer when I get out of here. Uh, just for him, like, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Clap them together. I, together. I won't have to. But I can pretend, though. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Clap your hand like. <laughs> <laughs> but um, with that being said, uh, we have. We're not going to get into the breakdown of every single one of this. We both have three in our number one, the same one, which ties into the damn name of the day, so it only makes sense. Um, and we're just going to play them because we're a little short on time, so the custom time, instead of giving the background of every single one, we're just going to get into them, give you the name of them, and then play them. Quick, yeah, just quick, I just quick to, line synopsis for them. Yeah, go ahead. Basically, my promo is basically like, you got the obvious one that you think of, but these ones that I just love, they like ain't don't they like kind of like under the cover, like like you don't really what's the name much of them. And of course, one of them, I mean, it's once you hear a promo, you know why it's there, <laughs> why it's there. So that's it. All right, let's get into these. So um, I'll start off with my first one because it's the shortest one, and then I'm gonna jump right to your first one, which is. At, hold on. No, we're going to go to yours first because then my first one and your second one both yeah. are both talking about the same wrestler. Those are two separate promos. So <laughs> I just figured it would make sense to put them together that way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the first one is um, Stone Cold destroying Stephanie McMahon. So I'm, I'm going to uh, mute us for this right quick. A miracle is a fact, and I don't give you a stone cold stunner right here, right now. I feel so good, I can't. Hey, I got some apologies I want to make too. What I am sorry about is the fact that I didn't scoop that car up again and drop that son bitch as many times as it took to get the job done. I'm sorry right now. I gotta smell your stinking breath, and you should be out at the funeral home picking up a casket. I know that son bitch is in a hospital bed with the TV right there in front of him. So Hunter, stone cold, accept your apology. You flapped your gums about having a baby with Triple H. I regret the day that comes around and I drive up to the hospital to offer my condolences and look at that little incubator thing. Look down there and see a 15-pound nose so full of manure they can't keep enough diapers on the little bastard. I nearly lost. <laughs> so that was him going ham on on Triple H on on Stephanie McMahon on uh, well I guess on behalf of Triple H she she was there to catch it. All right, so this next one, the heat in vitriol is uh, directed at Bret the Hitman Hart. First, we're gonna do them in order because mine was actually later though it's shorter. I'm gonna go with yours first. Uh, this is him cutting a promo on him at Survivor Series '96. back to continue a legacy. Uh -huh. Stone Cold's gonna make your comeback a living hell. You can start begging for some mercy you right will. now. Beg for you're mercy. not gonna find it. I think you're completely pathetic. You're the best 
best there is, was, and ever will be, whatever. Sir, you're looking at the best there Austin is. Austin 316 rules. I will kick your pink and black ass all over the garden. I'm going to end your you legacy. You will beg for mercy. You know, Brett, the whole world knows that you quit the WWF you quit. because you lost to Shawn Michaels. The pretty boy. The boy toy. Kick your ass back to Canada. You couldn't face yourself and you can't fucking oh, face you ran right away in shame. Pick another time to come I back, son. I'm no sexy When the boy. bell rings and it's time to get down to business, I'm going to take seven years of frustration and being pissed off out on your ass. Think about it like this, Brett. You can finally go home, look yourself in the mirror, and get a little peace of mind because you will know you were indeed beat by a real man. I don't yeah. dare. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't no sexy boy. <laughs> that was the best. Oh, that was awesome. All right, so uh, the next one, the last of your three, is another one uh, directed at Stephen McMahon, ironically. Uh, You'll just know why this one is there. Yeah, we ain't even got to say it. You know. <laughs> this is like a gift and a curse. The beating Ric Flair just gave my father is nothing compared to what Triple H, my husband, is going to give 29 other men in the Royal Rumble. Triple H is going to destroy Kurt Angle. Triple H is going to destroy The Undertaker. And Triple H is going to destroy Stone Cold Steve Austin. I just wish that Stone Cold's little wife, Deborah, was going to be at ringside because I would like to destroy her. Deborah thinks she's all uh -oh. mean and tough. Steph. Well, Triple H has taught me a thing Steph. or two. Because you Stephanie. see, Triple H and I, we're a team. I mean, he's here, all he's in the right. room. What? What? Um, what? Um, you got five your girls about what Triple H is gonna do to me? Yeah, Over the top rope? I'm 29 people? What? You're gonna kick Deborah's ass? What? Go ahead, talk. What? 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 You got something to say to me? You wanna talk about the Royal Rumble? Yeah, I'd love to ask you about the. What? I'd love to ask you about. What? You wanna ask Stone Cold who's gonna win the Royal Rumble? Yeah, who's gonna. Stone Cold! I said Stone Cold! Stone Cold! What part of Stone Cold do you not understand? Three and a half pieces of trash. Over the top rope. That includes Triple H. Kurt Angle. The Undertaker. The bottom line. The bottom line. The bottom line is Stone Cold Steve Austin is going to win the Royal Rumble and go to WrestleMania. And that's the bottom line. Why? Because Stone Cold said so. The, the bottom line is The bottom line is one word? What? That was a good one. <laughs> we were clowning while it was going on. <laughs> Stephanie's crimped hair that was from 92, though this is 2002, and her ultra-revealing top because she just got those boobies. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty oh, funny. Man. That was pretty funny. Nice time, nice time capsule there. Okay, so that was Flint's first three. Like we said, his number one is the same as mine. We'll get there in a second, and we'll, you'll understand why we saved that for number one in a minute. Now, let's get into some of mine. So, I was supposed to do my Hitman a second ago, but we, I just did all of yours first. So, let me do my Hitman right quick because it's, it's short. See, short and sweet. Shit, man. <laughs> Next is going to be... My next two are kind of longer, but I'm going to shorten them. So this one we're going to play the first two minutes of. The next one, um, I'll give it a little more time. These are from his days in ECW when he first... Before he made his WWF move. And he was first getting out of WCW, and he's talking about some of the frustrations while in WCW and why he's at where he's at right now. It, it, mm -hmm. That's as much I need to explain to it. 
told his secretary to tell her secretary to leave a message on my answering machine for me to call Eric Bischoff. And then I called Eric Bischoff and he proceeded to fire me over the phone. I thought a big cloud was lifted off the career of Steve Austin. Because gone were the days where I'd go up to someone and say, hey, what about me and Sting? We got this big thing going, how about the cage? And someone says, no baby, that's for somebody else. We're just gonna keep you right where you at right now. Well, then I said, well, how about me and Savage, man? I got this great idea, man. He comes in, he's got the Slim Jim deal. Well, hell, I got... No, Steve, that's for somebody else, baby. <laughs> there you go. I got this great idea I can do with Hulk Hogan. I'm going to be the Steve Maniac, and we're going to take this thing all the way because Hulk Hogan, Hulkamania, was the biggest thing to ever come down to wrestling's pike. And they say, No, it's not for you, brother. You can't do that. We're going to keep you right where you are. I said, How about me and Brian get back together? The Hollywood Blondes, it was the best tag team to come along in 10 years. And they say, no, Steve, we need you in a singles role, man. We need you to do this. We're going to put the U.S. title on you, and then we're going to take you here, and then you're the number one contender, so then you got this world title shot. Well, all that never happened. So there I am, floundering along. There's nothing going my way because the politics in WCW kept the biggest potential superstar in wrestling on the damn ground. What are you supposed to do? On one hand, they're paying you a bunch of money. They're paying me a bunch of money. Well, on this hand, they're telling me, hey, Go out there and give Bagwell a hell of a match. Go out there with an 18-year-old German kid. Give him seven good minutes. Let the people see what he can do. They say you are what you eat. In WCW, they didn't feed me nothing but garbage. So I let myself become garbage. I became complacent with everything that they said. As long as Big Ted kept sending in the checks, Maybe I wasn't happy with what was going on, but I became complacent. Then they send me to Japan, the big injury. Bischoff delivers a shot heard around the damn world. Steve Hawkins out of the high paying job. We'll play the whole damn thing if I don't stop it there, so I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> um, it's a great one to look into. It's a Superstar Steve Austin promo if you want to hear the whole thing. It's like seven and a half minutes long. We just played the first three. All right, and then uh, my next one is of what Steve's second best ECW promo, of what he thinks of Monday Night Nitro. And welcome to Dealer's Box. This week, my box is going to get an up-close and personal feel for something that's... Hold on, I gotta acknowledge that. I had to stop it. Do you realize her talk her talk show's name is Bueller is Bueller's Box? Her talk show's name is Bueller's Pussy. Basically, and that's how she's promoting the shit. You guys can't see that. You're already hearing the audio. She's set a table, sitting down with her foot up, just giving you damn near a crotch shot, and she says, "Welcome to Bueller's Box." <laughs> this is nuts. Okay, there we go. Machine, and when he calls me, 
I'm going to fire him on the phone just like I did Austin because that's the way I deal with people. I'm not a very brave man, and that's the bottom line. Okay, big show tonight. Like I said, if you're watching another channel, get over here. If you're thinking about watching another wrestling promotion, don't do it because this is the only one that's live. Okay, big main event tonight. Never before seen on TV. The most dangerous match in the world. And you're gonna see it right here on Monday Night Quill. Oh yeah, yes, right here on Monday Night Quill. Bottle of Geritol on a pole match. First time ever in the world. You're gonna see all the old codgers here in our organization and they're gonna be scrapping around and using their walkers, trying to keep the ditchers in, and they're going for it because this is the hottest show on TV. Brother, this is the bottom line. We're number one. Did I repeat that I already fired the brain over the phone? Oh yeah, this is where the big boys play with each other. Oh yeah, did I tell you that we're number one? Okay, I'm gonna get, okay, the cameraman's telling me we gotta go to a break. I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't know the names of any of the holes, but I'm gonna sit here and bubble around and bubble around, and if I put you to sleep, if I don't put you to sleep, the matches probably will. So bear with us, this is Monday Night Quill, and we're live! I told you it was classic. <laughs> that was a good, that was a good impression of uh, Uncle Eric, Uncle Salty Bitch. <laughs> that was pretty fucking funny. <laughs> and you had it, the wig was the crazy. Yeah, bro. Uh, His wig was crazy as fuck. <laughs> and finally, the namesake promo for the reason why there is even a Stone Cold Day outside of the man himself. I mean, no words are needed. The fourth prestigious king of the ring, Stone Cold Steve Austin, an incredible victory. The first thing I want to be done is to get that piece of crap out of my ring. Don't just get him out of the ring, get him out of the WWF. Because I prove, son, without a shadow of a doubt, you ain't got what it takes anymore. You sit there and you thump your Bible and you say your prayers and it didn't get you anywhere. Talk about your Psalms, talk about John 3.16. Austin 3.16 says I just whipped your ass. Come on, that's not necessary. All he's got to do is go buy him a cheap bottle of Thunderbird and try to dig back some of that courage he had in his pride. As the king of the ring, I'm serving notice to every one of the WWF superstars. I don't give a damn what they are. They're all on the list, and that's Stone Cold's list, and I'm fixing to start running through all of them. As far as this championship match is considered, son, I don't give a damn if it's Davey Boy Smith or Shawn Michaels. Steve Austin's time has come. And when I get the shot, you're looking at the next WWF champion. And that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. Classic. Classic, as we were sitting here laughing at the promo as he was saying it. I had to say my man was on the Thunderbird. Again, he gave him the good liquor. Had to give him the wino drink. Had to give him the wino drink. Dave, that's when I look at Curry. <laughs> that is crazy anyway all right so let's get into uh the dark side of the ring which was about buff bagwell and his family all right so this was a crazy episode about buff uh, i've heard it in many iterations they didn't have my favorite buff bagwell story and we're short on time so i can't really share it here um but you know about it already. Yeah. The one with about yes, that shit was fucking hilarious. But anyway, um, so I wish they would have talked about it on here, but they did. Oh, <laughs> that would have been so funny, bro. I'm telling you. Anyway, I want to see the reenactment of him smashed between two dudes' arms. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we'll talk about it later. All right, so uh, Mar Marcus Alexander Bagwell. I uh, was born in Georgia. I forgot exactly where. Yeah, I got my last. I kind of want to say Marietta, but I'm not positive. So it, it's here nor there. Um, so you know, we know about his mom because she ended up being in WCW. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, Judy and his dad was a race car driver. I believe his name was Steve. 
<coughs> now they were a rich family at first. They had the had race car money. He bought them a Corvette at fifteen. He said he wanted to buy them all the stuff he that he always that. wanted. But at the same time, he said they would still whoop their ass though. They didn't want him. Mm -hmm. He said live privileged, but don't feel privileged. Like don't feel like this can't happen to you. You know what I'm saying? Type of deal. Humble yourself. Yeah, exactly. His father was crazy. His mom ran a lumber yard. Everybody in the town bought lumber for him. Around the age of fifteen to eighteen, in between there, the problems arose in the family as far as finances became concerned because the lumberyard started losing money and mom started taking out loans around the city thinking she'd be able to pay it back and she could just talk them into it and then it became more than they could pay back and i guess he wasn't making as much money his dad off of drag racing as he thought but his dad was living it up they told this one story about when uh, he was 18 marcus and his friends was in their room just chilling getting ready to go out and kick it they're about to go to a club or something his dad came in Went in his pocket and was just like, oh, where y'all about to go? Okay, here. Bam, 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 bam. Just start busting out bags of coke to each one of the boys and shit. And he was like, listen, I know what y'all doing. Y'all might go try this in the street. So if anything, I want y'all to get it from my guy because then at least I know it's safe what you're doing. So I don't know if you want to say dad was super cool. <laughs> if dad, uh, dad was helping contribute to a problem that was going to arise later in life majorly. Um, I don't know how you want to say it. So as much as I'm talking about, you know, the sunny times, you know, they had some financial struggles coming up. Everything wasn't always sunny. Um, there was an incident that happened where the mom, you know, because of the financial issues, there's a lot more fights that arose between Judy Bagwell and Steve. One of these incidents happened where they were arguing like over a car where Judy was about to leave. Like, I'm not sitting around for this shit. I'm out. Steve came outside like, where the fuck you going? And Judy's like, I'm taking off. And Steve was like, that's fine. You ain't taking off of my shit. Talk about his car. Mm -hmm. And they were arguing, and it got louder and louder. So Marcus overhears this, and his dad already has a temper. I skipped this part. I forgot to mention. There was an incident that happened earlier that happened a few years down the line where the dad had a poker game and was just losing his ass, like 80 yeah, grand. Yeah. Start got so mad, <laughs> he went outside with a Uzi, and started murdering the geese yeah. like Scarface yeah. shooting at the gorillas running in his mansion at the end of the movie. And he just saw blood and feathers flying everywhere. And he's like, ah, ah, you motherfuckers, ah, ah, like that doing this shit. Yeah. So the man's crazy. So let's just, there's that southern aspect to it. So let's put that in there. Um, so as they're arguing, Marcus comes outside with a strap. He's like, hey, man, I need you to back off moms and leave her alone because just, you know, let's just leave it alone, dad. Just forget it. And um, he was a mama boy. He Pops was, mama. was like, oh, for real, cuz? Oh, you got a strap, cuz? Oh, you a man now, huh, cuz? Okay, You want to pop them guns? So he <laughs> he went, this is how I know some Southern shit, because how many straps were just randomly around. He went and got his own private strap to keep on top of the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. Mar there. Marcus knew, like, he's he going to get there. his strap. He's going to get his strap. So they went and confronted him in the kitchen. He, before he could fully... Rise the barrel, Steve, rise the barrel with his strap. Marcus shot first. His hand blocked where it would have shot. It almost shot him in his heart. His hand blocked that shot, and he said it grazed the yeah. bone on his wrist. And they had to take, I think they said, uh, skin graft. Skin graft from like maybe his hip or something to fill in this part of the bone. Um, if he ain't put his hand right there, he would have literally killed his dad. They said he dumped six other shots that were just whizzing by him that missed. Yeah. The first one hit. Yeah. His father did call him after a couple of weeks later. He took all the blame for it and apologized to Marcus. So they're still cool to this day. The father is still alive. He was part of the dark side. So that was just some of the interesting stories that made him. But from these um, incidents and things like this, they didn't have any money coming in like they had before when he grew up rich and stuff because he had some other brothers, but he was the most famous of the brothers. He played a lot of sports and stuff in high school. He was always looked at as like a pretty boy and stuff. So... First, he starts stripping when he gets out of high school. I guess that wasn't enough money. But then it also where he like, like kind of like met like his high school sweetheart, his yeah, first yeah. wife. I believe her name was Tanya. I believe. I'm not positive. I'm talking about So, um, Tanya starts dancing too, because yeah. he decides he's gonna get into wrestling. And in order for her to pay for wrestling school in his first early she times of wrestling, yeah. she danced though she hated it to help support him and, and put the, him through. And the deal was that soon as he gets signed his first contract. He basically like Would, gotta take care of her. Yeah, basically. yeah. Pay, return the favor. Yeah. Basically, and then I think they said he started like he met up with Missy Hyatt or whatever. Yeah, he, his, oh his, his car gosh. broke down or something. Oh, we wow. Yeah, I, 
Yeah, no. What? I, I let me. I'm like, oh my god, between you and Terry Reynolds, like, oh. You what like happened? her? Oh no. <laughs> she she did get very leathered, but at least she she didn't have enough work done where she doesn't look like who she was before. I can still tell it was Missy Hyatt. Yeah. And she still got money because she was wearing all Gucci on that episode, yeah. bro. Oh yeah, she still oh yeah. You so know, her cash like, is good. You know, she still got them them residuals from them old days. She was named she won the first uh the interviewer, yeah, so, so, so talked about no, how they uh props to her. I heard she got into the uh, sidebar story, I heard she got into the business by giving a wrestler a blowjob when she was 14 years old. Fucked up story, but true. <laughs> she said it herself, I forgot the wrestler, so I'm not gonna put anybody on the line. The guy's probably dead by now, anyway. It was an 80s wrestler, but um, yeah, went to the matches, got to meet the wrestler at, at backstage later on in the back of his car, sucked his dick. That's how she got into the business. 14 years old. It's fucked up. Anyway, um, so she saw Marcus. He was fixing his car or something. He had on some short shorts on a tank top. She thought that he was hot. And then um, one thing led to another. She like, gave him a place to stay. And then he, she knew a guy that helped him train him to get him into the business. And she was already at WCW at the time. And she yeah. brought Marcus up by bringing a tape to Jim Hurd. Pizza Man. <laughs> so she brought a tape to Jim Hurd. Uh, who's you know, he's the former president of WCW back in the day. Um, ladies, um, so he said to bring him in, they love Marcus. Marcus ended up becoming like rookie of the year over there. Use his full name, Marcus Alexander yeah. Badwell. <laughs> Excuse me, his first real breakout once he got into wrestling, and he was still married at the time and stuff. His first real breakout came as he teamed on a tag team with Two Cold Scorpio. Or in the words of uh, Hero Wrestling, two cold scorch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> two cold Scorpio. So uh, they they became tag team champs a couple times, and eventually they broke them up. Then they had the next one was his best worst iteration to me because of the dumbass fucking song. Matter of fact, I I can't do it justice by singing it here. I mean, I'm going to let you keep talking for a second while I find the song right quick. <laughs> so he gets into American Dudes. Talk about oh, American Dudes. Oh, God. Was that him and uh, Scotty, uh, Riggs. Scotty Riggs? Yep. <laughs> what they said that, like, he said he felt that was his best, him at his best, because that was actually him. And, like, that whole little video montage they was playing, that song is so damn annoying. <laughs> annoying, he talked about how that Uncle Salty Bitch was on. That's where he made his uh, yeah. entrance into the episode, was uh -huh. singing that shit. He was like, don't play that shit. It's going to get stuck in my head yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, about, and then they went on talking about how they had a couple successful runs there, and he got asked by uh, Kevin Nash about, uh, hey, man, do you do, do you want to join NWO? And he said, yeah, I love joining NWO. And he told Scotty about it. And Scotty was like, well, instead of... Scotty had it basically like a professional. He said, well, I ain't gonna bitch about me not getting ass. So, we just gonna do it like that. Take it. Take this in. You gotta get into this shit. This shit is fucking terrible. American males, 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 American American man, he sounds as bad as me when Fairbanks laughed at me for, uh, for doing Macho Man jumping on the beat. Oh. <laughs> That's probably where Mosh got it from, probably. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. oh, I fucking love it. Anyway, anyway, I'm sorry. He said that um, he got asked by Kevin Nash to join NWO, and he told Scotty Riggs about it, and Scotty said he could, Scotty had it like a professional. He said, well, we'll just do it like this. We get in the ring, you know, what's the name? 
And then he just gave him the net break, and that's when he turned on. And then they said when he went to NWO, oh, my God. That's when it went from 0 to 100 with Buff, basically, because the ego took over. The best, it was one of the funniest parts to me is when they showed the guy in the reenactment segments <laughs> doing the buff with the hat, like the dance or the walk, the strut. That shit was funny as fuck. I was laughing when that happened. I think... I think uh, Tugo Scorpio said it best. He like you had Marcus, and Marcus was a real cool dude, man. He could talk to. He like Buff. Buff was just an arrogant asshole who I wanted to punch in the face. <laughs> in the face. They talk about did they get to a match uh, against Rick Steiner where uh, he ends up? Uh, well, he thought he broke. Thought he broke his it, it ended up being a severe bruise to his spine. Um. So what happened was, uh, Rick uh, went for the bulldog off the top rope. He slipped off his head, so when Marcus landed, he landed. Rick landed first, and Marcus's head yeah. landed into his shoulder and went back, yeah. which caused him to feel like he was paralyzed. So what actually happened was that the bruise caused swelling around the neck, which causes your body to feel like it's paralyzed. But once the swelling goes down, you get up. Like, that's exactly how they explained it on the show. They were like, yeah. the doctor came into the room and was like, get up. He was like, what? He was like, get up. So he was like, he leaned forward, and he was like, I feel but what happened? He was like, well, and he explained exactly what I just said about just, you know, just yeah. swelling around the neck and stuff like that. So they sold it as an angle. They said he was off TV for like three months. His mother was helping him back to the ring. This ended up getting Judy involved, you know what I'm saying, in the wrestling side of stuff too, eventually here and things of that nature. So was it was a Canyon, I think, who supposedly. Canyon was the few, yep, yeah. where they had Judy Bagwell on a pole match. And she was based on a forklift, not a pole. Um, also, you had, um, this is where Buzz first marriage broke up also, because all the women that came along with it, he started living the gimmick. And that's really, I think, what changed his life is yeah. that starting to live the gimmick was starting to, was running his body down eventually. Red Flair did the same thing. Red Flair said, he said, out the nature, boy. He like, I lived it, like, every, every day. You know what I'm saying? That's why he has four or five wives and all those kids, you know? Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so Buff loses his first marriage this way. Um, uh, but you know, he, you know, he's doing NWO stuff. He's doing all right. Uh, ends up being while the neck injury is still going on, he ends up being uh, Scott Steiner's manager yeah. in NWO. Things of that nature. Eventually, things move on where we know WCW gets bought out by WWE. He comes in and on that first one. They have that match in the main event between him and Booker T that they thought was such a shitty match. He never thought it was such a shitty match. He was just like, it's just a match. Like, I didn't think it was that bocce, but everybody else seems to shit on the match. Um, yeah. And then from there, it led to his downfall in the company because then they stopped booking him. He, uh, he said, I think he said they had something to where they are going to put the title on him. And they told him, go ahead, go ahead. We'll call you back. And then they said they fired him like a week later. <laughs> they said his mom tried to call in for him to figure out what was going on. She was trying to handle his business. So him being a man, him handling his own business was part of the problem. Another thing that happened, and this is important to tell. I don't want to skip over this because I actually have words from the man. So apparently this part that I'm about to talk about is disputed by the other person that was involved in this segment. I have his word. I have Shane, oh, you got it? Because I got it too. I'm going to let you read it since you got it. So apparently he had a fight with Shane Helms where he was supposed to come in and do some in-ring work, but he came in late. And he said Shane Helms was talking shit to him at first when he came in. He's like, look at you. Buff the stuff. Coming in late like ain't nobody else important but himself. And Buff said, look. Like, listen, bro, like, I ain't trying to have no issue. We can handle this one or two ways. We could drop it right now and just continue to work, you know what I'm saying? Or I could smack your teeth out your mouth. He said before he could say option two or whatever he's going to say out of his mouth, he said he had what he called was the pat in his back with a slap. Yeah. That his daddy taught him there's a slap where you basically take, you slap somebody so fucking hard that you take authority of the situation. Like, they, they wondering, like, hold the fuck on, what I just step into type of deal. So he said that's what he did. And, you know, Shane is a cruiserweight, so he was smaller than Buff, so he smacked him to the ground. Well, apparently Buff didn't know that Shane had a ice cold, I mean, fully iced over bottle of water, cracked him on the back of his head with it in the ring. Said he was instantly busted open from the back, blood was everywhere. He said he went and got his own staples in his head, didn't tell anybody. So during that match with Booker T that night, he had 25 staples in his head that he had to take a black marker to over each staple so nobody could see him during the match. 
Now, let's get to Shane Helms, the other man involved in the situation, and get his side of the story. Well, Shane Helms uh, said that his story about him wasn't true. Uh, he said that it started from, uh, I think he said about the thing about, uh, it started, he said that Bagwell confronted him at a training section where him basically caught him a drug addict. Addict. Bagwell said he slapped him and turned to leave him, sent him with a frozen water bottle, which required him to work his debut with 24 staples in his head. He said he released following the infamous bad match with Booger T. He said with well, he changed their plans into the invasion angle. He said he was released because he was blamed for hitting Helms first. Something that he him denied in the serial post of social media after being tagged by a fan. So he wrote this. <clears throat> he said, I didn't cost Bagwell his contract neither. Buff is a lying piece of shit. Always has been. There were there were witnesses there and none agree with Buff. He used to blame Jim Ross, too. Blame everyone except the man in the mirror. Nothing wrong with failing that Sunday, but accountability is key. Everyone associated with that episode of Dork so I can Suck Ass. <laughs> and then in response to his comments, he wrote, He literally went on the show and told a bunch of lies. No more second chances for me. From me. From me. Uh, and then, of course, I got Booker T, because he had his take about why that, ma that infamous match, too. Oh, boy. And he said, let me speak on one thing, just to clarify. Just to back Bagwell up on a couple of things. That night, Bagwell and I, we had to go out and work. It was literally the first time two sub WCW guys were in the main event. I do remember AJ talking to me, telling me exactly what what they didn't want me to do. They told me to look straight at the camera, go and work, don't shake nobody's hand. That was my thing. Go out happy, shaking hands, high five me. And they told Bagwell to do the same thing. Go straight out, just go straight to work. And that was something I found very odd, kind of suspicious. We weren't put in position to see back then in WWE. None of the WCW guys were. We were put out there to fail. We were put out there to get our asses beat and for WWE to plant the flag and say, man, we won this war. We got the best wrestlers in the world, and we just proved it with these two guys in the ring right here. So that part about Bagwell's story was true. Was it the greatest match I ever had? No. Was it the worst match I ever had? I don't even think it was the worst match I ever had, but I do know, no matter what we did that night, those fans in Tacoma, Washington didn't give a damn about Booker T or Marcus Buff Bagwell. It was a rough night. <laughs> it was a rough night. A rough night. Uh, basically, he also turned down the Dark Side episode, saying that we heard about WWE run as far as Buff Bagwell's standpoint. It just didn't work out. That match we had in Washington, that has come up a lot of times. Dark Side of the Ring had reached out to me to be part of some of the series of episodes. I just turned him down because me personally, anything that happened with Buff Bagwell and I, anything that I got to say about Buff Bagwell, it's private. It's internal. And it's something that him and I know, and I'm not going to expose it or put it out there just like that. Just so because I don't think the world really needs to know what happened with Bagwell and I that night or anything like that. So the way it's written is the way it's going to be told from here on out. I won't have anything to say about it. About it. Two things I forgot to mention was two important stories that are actually pretty funny I want to mention here. First of all, we forgot, well, I forgot, I should say, that um, one of the things that Buffett did that was super geek was, <coughs> excuse me, he got calf implants. He built his body up oh, full God. of muscle, but the one thing he could never get was good calves. Uh, he had a buddy named Mark Johnson. The nickname was Slick. He was living with Slick. Slick said his legs, they looked great at first when he got them, but then his body wasn't accepting them and started rejecting them. It got so bad that he couldn't move. He couldn't get up and walk. So whenever he had to go to the bathroom, Slick would have to pick him up, piggyback style on his back, walk him to the toilet, sit him on it, yeah. let him do his business, and go back and pick him up and do reverse of everything he just did, riding piggyback back to his favorite spot on the couch or whatever. So that's a hell of a friend right there, number one. Number two... His family came through for him in many ways. One of the ways his family did come through for him that his mother shaved his balls for him during his wrestling career. Slick walked in on that, too. And it was normal for him. She just was tucking his kid back on his balls, getting right under the gooch. It was like, hey there, Mark. How you doing, honey? So those are two important stories I forgot to mention then. <laughs> I thought I'd throw back in there. <laughs> 
I thought I'd throw that in there for you, man. I forgot about that. One thing that showed he was big on family, though, is Marcus hired his family. As his, uh, his mom as his personal assistant and secretary and hired other people to do stuff for him, like clean his house, you know, pay his he bills his family while he was out of town, you know what I'm saying, working in the wrestling business and stuff like that. He also been trying to cut an actor. He made some uh, straight-to-video action movies that looked pretty shit shitty. Bad, bro. So it, it basically looked like softcore porn to me. Like shit you'd see at 2 in the morning on Skinamax. You know what I'm saying? That's what it looked like. Seriously, it did. So anyway. Well, he did softcore porn. So, I mean, <laughs> We'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. So anyway, from here he gets fired. So then he has to start working the indies, but the money isn't the same. Um, I believe while he was working his indies is when he ends up meeting his second wife because he starts having more um, incidents with drugs and stuff. You know what I'm saying? After the neck injury, the drugs really started to come into play. Uh, in his life, where his addiction started coming up. We didn't really talk about that part of it yet. Um, he was working many independent shows while battling his addiction. He tried to get clean. Uh, he ended up wrecking his Jeep the first time. Yeah. He did this like three or four different times. Um, he had a withdrawal of seizures. Uh, eventually, he, um, in, the, in somewhere along in this time, he meets his second wife, Judy, which is ironic because he has the same name as his mom's. So now he has two Judy Bagwells in his life. <laughs> so that's interesting. But anyway. So, um, she actually, they said that she actually helped save his life. The, the plates in his neck from getting it broke in the ring saved it from being worse this time after the truck rolled. It actually saved his life. So, he had plenty of bills to pay. He's getting down his luck, didn't have a lot of money. And he ended up getting offered that show on Showtime. We talked about softcore, gigolos. It's funny because Mark, uh, because Two Call Scorpio was like, how the fuck he get offered that when his dick was about this big? <laughs> it was plenty. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so that part really had me laughing too, because I remember when that show was out, and like the, he was explaining about how the one scene went when he had to go in the room with the lady, but he couldn't get hard on camera, so he had to act like he was. So he had to like act like he was eating her out. He was act like he was hitting it, <laughs> and he just, from the back and the way they like just showed the camera angle, just looked so funny, looking at his fucking face like putting it, fake putting it in work. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like what the fuck are we doing here like what is going on anyway so he gets back to the bar to get paid for it and he told the producer like hey bro like my bad man i could get no blood rust and some shit you know what i'm saying so like we didn't really do this shit he was like you weren't supposed to <laughs> so i guess it was all set up to be exactly what it was me. <laughs> i guess it was all set up to be exactly what it was the part that makes this fucked up from here though is the fact that it became a real thing for him where he actually did because women were willing to pay i think it's an upwards of ten thousand dollars to spend whole weekends it was like three thousand like for two hours like eight thousand for a night like 10 to 15 for a whole weekend it was bands eventually he meets a lady that became stalking him and like became super interested in them. And instead of him seeing the situation, this silly motherfucker with this woman who's rolled with him through thick and thin, through all these car accidents, all these addictions, all your seizures, all your bullshit. I'm sure you've probably cheated on her before. Even through the Gigolo show where he told her what was going on, where I may or may not have to sleep with these women. I know I was supposed to be making an appearance, but baby, I got to do it with the money. It's for us. This woman that seems to be stalking him has a little bit more money. And he was just like, Lord, he held me down all this time through all my bullshit. Might be a stalker, but got a little bit more cash. I'm going with the stalker, babe. I'm sorry. I'm rolling. And let her know I'm bounced. I'm like this fucking asshole. <laughs> bounced on his wife. So that's bye-bye Judy Bagwell, number two. Uh, also through this time, eventually he gets uh he was on the website when he meets this lady named cowboys for angels that's what oh, it was called yeah. all right so from there his life gets worse with addiction and things like that his mom ends up dying so we lose the original judy bagwell rest in peace to her it seemed like a pretty great woman i mean she was down for him so much she was shaving his balls i mean <laughs> That's a lot, man. I don't know if my mom's shaping my balls either way, but still, it's some dedication there to your kid. Um, she had dementia, and that was awful. So, um, moving on from there, she also battled Alzheimer's disease. Um, that's, yeah, that's basically 
unfortunately will enter the mind. Yeah. Uh, moving on from there, he eventually it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. The story, the Sean Mooney stuff happened. And eventually, he ends up getting hooked up with like DDP yoga. They end up saving his life because his situations with the drugs are tough to skin. They said his mom death actually is what made him finally made him finally realize try to like, snap out of it and stuff. Your, you need to get your shit together. So he ends up getting with DDP and getting his shit together. And then during this and you know plotting for this dark side episode we're talking about he ends up finding about scotty riggs and scotty riggs has his own issues yeah, he had yeah. just lost his house that he'd been staying in for his mom so he'd been taking care of her before she had passed. passed and then he would be living out of his car for like six months he was on the verge of putting a gun to his own chest and committing suicide himself he convinced scotty to come up there with him in georgia and get with ddp to try to help save his life and it showed that they are both doing good now you know, trying to just hang in there, you know what I'm saying? And old friends leaning on each other. Um, Marcus is now have another woman in his life by the end of the episode. Again. I think he married again. I don't know if he got, they were married? Yeah, okay. Married again. So, um, he said she helped save his life. I'm not sure of this woman's name, but, you know, props to her. Um, and throughout all of this, and him being such a gigantic asshole at many different times, all of these women still had love for him. The first wife, Tanya... Judy still loved him because they loved the man that they, you know, fell in love with, not the monster he became. And at the same time, the one thing I can say that they never really mentioned, I don't know if it's the case, none of them either claimed it either. He wasn't abusive to them. He was more abusive to himself. Yeah. And that ended up leading to a lot of his other downfalls. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said he was like his own worst enemy. But he that's why I was like, he wasn't that bad of he a person. Was, he, he was just like kind of very condescending he, and egotistical. He, and yeah. that uh, that helped lead to the downfall too. Yeah. Gimmick basically is what basically Living his gimmick, gimmick. Exactly. Living his gimmick and it almost cost him his life. Cost him his life. Like that's basically what it was. Like, he he lived the gimmick too hard and but yeah, all the women they still got love for him though. They said they still talk to him and like they 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 do that. You can tell too when they called him Marcus. It's like that's when it's like okay. They yeah. call him Buff during the show. They call yep, him Marcus. Call him Marcus. Marcus like, yeah, or Mark. Yeah. So that was Dark Side of the Ring. Buff and the Bagwells. Let's get into our TV show reports so we can get out of here. Um, start off with last Saturday with Collision. Uh, last Saturday's Collision opened with Shane Taylor taking on Brian Danielson. Um, Shane Taylor talking a lot of shit to Brian Danielson throughout the match. Remembering his last match he had two years ago with Lee Moriarty, where he felt like he didn't treat him as well as he should have, I guess. Eventually, Dan Bryanson gets the upper hand in this match. Um, good match between the two. Running knee finishes uh, off Shane Taylor of 14 minutes even. Post-match, Will Ospreay comes out for a chat. Dan Bryanson interrupted his main event last week, so he brought that up. He said, so I figured I'd return the favor. You're one of the reasons that I came here, you cheeky little slag. And I've decided, Dan Bryan basically called him out for saying in your promos, you say you're the best wrestler in the world, or I'm here for you to prove it. So they basically set up a match between the two at AEW Dynasty, so that should be great. We'll see what happens from there. Next up, the Young Bucks. Um, the new elite with um, the Young Bucks, Marcus and Matthew Jackson. I, I think I just said that wrong. Nicholas and Matthew Nicholas. Jackson. Sorry about that. <laughs> and Okada taking on a couple of jobbers, John Cruz, Liam Gray, and Adrian Alanis. Basically, Okada comes in the ring and it's like, hang back, y'all. I got this. <laughs> Get the time in the squash. Mm -hmm. It's a three on three. They had to get some work. I'm saying a minute 50. Close. Off by 13 seconds. Two minutes and three seconds. Um, Okada did all the work in this one. Finished it off with a rainmaker. Literally taking out all three of the men inside of those two minutes. Post-match, Eddie Kingston runs in. Pissed off about what happened last week. Gets beaten down. Uh, Penta S0 Mado comes out to try to help him. He also gets taken out, too, by the numbers game. Cue the returning bastard. Pac is returned um, from a long injury hiatus to come out and help uh, Penta and Eddie has a stare down with Okada. Um, and we'll look to see them uh, in the future. They're going to have a six man that comes up on Dynamite. That is Penta, Pac, and Eddie versus the new version of the Elite. Uh, next up is Mariah May taking on Trisha Dora. This one goes about six minutes. Mariah May finishes off Trisha Dora with a Mayday still dressed as Tony Storm. 
So that should be interesting what happens there. Post-match, uh, Tony Storm comes out and presents her with the first Tony Award, T-O-N-I, so they don't get sued. Uh, it's basically a shoe. Yeah, that. <laughs> uh, Donna Peraza comes down to interrupt everything. Uh, they start scrapping, and then she ends up catching a DDT um, from Mariah May that lays her out. And then she proceeds to put the said shoe on on top of Peraza as she's standing on top of her. So that was interesting, mm-hmm. too. Uh, next up, Nick Wayne takes on Adam Priest. Uh, Patriarchy out here also, too. Nick Wayne wins this one with a Wayne's World and a pin victory, 3 minutes and 12 seconds. <coughs> post match, they start to walk out, and some guy in the crowd in a luchador mask starts to grab at Christian. We know who this is. Yeah. Mr. Copeland. Yeah. Mr. Copeland ends up chasing Christian out. I thought this was funny. He chased him out to the parking lot after taking out other members of the patriarchy. He chased him out to the parking lot. Christian just steals a car. He's like, yeah, yeah, I gotta go. He just rats this guy out. And, yeah. and as he's doing it, he drives off with the yeah. belt throughout the sunroof. He GTA'd him. Actually. That's what he did. That's what he did. Good call. He GTA'd him. That was funny. <laughs> so, I thought that was funny. Um, Next up. This is why I'll slap nuts on the fucking loose. Yeah. So Jeff Jarrett says he's not sure if they can trust Mark Briscoe tonight because they're going to have a Atlanta street fight in the main event. So uh, we'll see where this goes. He said, but they'll all be together for the fight. Next uh, match with Jericho taking on Titan. Not Titan, Titan. I guess how they pronounce it. Uh, Mexico. Match went a little longer than I expected. And Jericho nowadays, while everybody's normal speed, he's about 0.75. But it was still a decent match, and they gave him the victory. He ends up reversing a springboard hurricane into the walls for the submission at 11 minutes and 59 seconds. Uh, Post match uh, against Agony running for the beatdown. Hook comes in for the save, setting up a tag match with Jericho and Hook versus the Gates of Agony on Dynamite coming up at Big Business. FTR out next for a chat. Uh, they want to. They want to talk about what happened at Revolution, them going down, but they want to make sure they're part of this new tag team tournament. And uh, so they're going to go after being the first AEW three time tag team champions. Cue the infantry from ROH with Sean Dean. Uh, they come out and they're uh, talking a lot of shit about, you know, um, they said the tag team division needs a revival. And uh, Harwood steps in and says the revival is dead. And when we meet you in the tournament, you will be too. So we'll see what happens from there. Uh, Mystico versus Angelico. You don't see Angelico a lot. Uh, good technical match between the two. CMLL wrestler won here. Hmm. Mm. Um, um, Conan. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mystica wins this one with a very, uh, with, uh, La Mystica finishes off in Helico in nine minutes, 26 seconds. Uh, next up, the main event, House of Black taking on Mark Briscoe, Jeff Jarrett, and Jay Lethal in an Atlanta street fight. This match had a little bit of everything, plenty of brawling outside of the ring. It was a very fun match at the same time. Vest, we get down to the end where Mark Briscoe goes through a flaming table. Uh, I don't think his back was fully burnt, you know what I'm saying? They got him out of the flames quick, got him in the ring, got him pinned out right quick. Um, so, it, you know, it went down. But it was a great match. Gave him plenty of time for the match. Also, the heels go over it, or as they say, the house always wins. 12 minutes, 47 seconds, and now with the end of Collision from last Saturday. All right, let's get to Monday Night Raw. Starts off with... Uh Drew McIntyre, he basically calls Seth Rollins a junkie, saying because he want to wrestle twice at Mania. He takes a shot at CM Punk, still taking shots at CM Punk. He did. He mentions The Rock. He said, wrestling has a ball, and we got a chance to work with the biggest star in the world. Basically kissing his ass. Rollins basically interrupts him. Uh, said, you want to claim more of me again? Take his glass. I said, do it right in my face while I'm right here. Basically, he laughs. He tell him to get over the bloodline. Rollins tells him to use his own advice. Uh, Rollins basically ready to go right now, but he said that's not good enough. He got all these injuries. McIntyre is the lowest of his list. List basically, he leaves frustrated. Uh, Gabe told about the gauntlet match. They have a gauntlet match of winner uh, gets uh, Gunter at Mania. First match we get is Becky Lynch versus Lil Morgan. Uh, great back and forth match here. Uh, Becky get the Lynch uh, with a manhandle slam. Slam, basically, great match. This match was 16 minutes. Uh, great match between them two, but Becky probably was going over. It's going to set up her run all the way to, uh, to uh, Mania. Respect is shown between the two at the end. Rhea Ripley comes out here. Liv basically yells something like, I'm going to ruin your life, so she's not done with Ripley yet. 
and ask her, is this worth it? You want to fight anyone, anytime, anywhere, just to prove that you're the best? Uh, she basically said that you, she said she better come to WrestleMania or she's walking one percent or she's walking out with a disappoint a disappointment. Rhea basically said that about Beck. Oh, we get a six pack ladder tag match for WrestleMania. Next we get Andy Hartwell cancel Ray versus Ivy Nile and Maxine Dupree. Uh basically the crust of this match is Candice LeRae Hill turn. Uh, she basically, this part was funny. So that thing go to do the worm and Candace was like, this is why people are booing you. <laughs> Real loud. <laughs> but then she told Slow, then she said, oh my God, good thing your brother ain't here to see this. Jeez. Like her brother's dead. So like, did go out yeah. and she went low. She said it to who? Uh, Matt Fiend Dupree. Yeah. Uh, and enough of the big boot for Hartwell to get the win here. Uh, Judgment Day complains about the match. Basically, uh, they say, it seemed like the R-Truth and Miz is behind it. They're supposed to be off of media, but R-Truth comes in because apparently he realizes it's Monday. You're a prize. Damian Priest tonight. Thank you. Uh, Cody promo. He said it feel good to slap your boss. <laughs> Ain't talking about how things changed. Chain. He talked mentioned about he was told about his uh Stardust character. Basically this he started talking about his mom. He said his mom is the only parent he has left. He can't hand a title to Dusty Rose, but he can hand it to her. Her. He said it's strange about him. Him. He said uh he's gonna finish the story at Mania. Ricochet gets ready for the gauntlet, JD gets ready for the gauntlet. Becky and Liv shake hands. Nia Jack says she can wreck both of them. Uh Tag team title match Kabuki Warrior versus Shayna Baszler though he start. Insane elbow. Uh damage control gets the win here. Uh we get the Damian Priest versus R Truth. Uh you know who gets the win here in eight minutes, Damian Priest. Becky Lynch challenged Nia Jack to a last man standing match. Uh Jay basically Calls uh, uh Jay said he came for a fresh start, but Jimmy and the bloodline won't let him go. He throws a challenge out for WrestleMania and he said he wants Jimmy to accept so he can beat his ass. <laughs> uh Gauntlet match. Ricochet versus JD. JD, uh JD gets the win here. Bronson Reed comes in at three. Takes him three minutes to go. Uh, Ricochet gets the win here. Bronson Reed comes in at three. Bronson Reed beats him in three minutes to make the match like what's the name? Basically squash them. Sami Zayn comes in. He uh, reverses the Sunset Bomb for a pin. Shinsuke comes in at five. Then he beats him with a Luva kick. Chad Gable's coming in at six. I swear to God, Chad Gable, bro. When they did that whole angle with Kurt Angle, bro, Chad Gable should be the son. i never seen one man hold on to an ankle lock four different ways. <laughs> Every time he tries something, he'll crank the ankle lock. And then he loses with a cradle pin. Cradle pin. This golly match basically took up like the second half of the, uh, the last hour. It's like 42 minutes, which was, was, was same long, but it was a great match though. Match though. Uh, Gable is, is 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 upset. He's pissed, but he show love to Sammy. Gunter comes out for a show. And that's the end of Raw. Like I said, a lot of Raw, a lot of these shows basically just fillers. But stuff. Uh, NXT. NXT was kind of bad this week. Week. Uh next first round of tender. Uh no TM versus LWO. LWO gets the win here with uh the 450. Uh Obafemi arrives here and almost got into a fight with Brooks Jensen. Dia Hale is basically just about JC Jane, saying she has other friends, choose Kalani Jordan. First main thing is Roxanne Perez. She explains her, her promo. Promo by she tacked her. She said it was years of frustration. She said she defeated uh, the last emperor, then collapsed because she'd been carrying the brand for a year. Then that came after carrying away the women's division and all kind of matches. But y'all right, talk about Tiffany Stratton or Becky Lynch. Lynch, she said, I was the women, the NSP women champion at 22 years old. Oh, she said Valkyria never got the rematch, but she never got the rematch she deserved. She said that, uh, People wanted to cheer her, but where were people in your heart was holding her title? She talked about how that, like, she cried when they booed her, when she had her stare down with Becky Lynch. Becky Lynch, uh, basically, nice promo, basically, by her. 
Let's see. Scroll down. Scroll down. Next, we get uh, Lexus King versus Mr. Stone. He finally gets a win here. Now, Mr. Stone, Brian Pillman Jr. At 3 minutes and 31 seconds. Next, we get Brooke Jensen versus Oba Femi for the uh, North American Championship match. Uh, Femi gets the win here at uh, 11.42. Basically, uh, uh, Briggs was in uh, Jensen's corner, basically. Uh, next, uh, the D'Angelo family basically kidnapped Dragunov. So they take him to a trunk on a bridge. Take him, they kidnap him, put him in a trunk, and drop him off on a bridge. Bridge. And then he basically said that you can't walk to my restaurant uninvited. He said he talking about bringing people to the bridge and leaving them alone, but this ain't one of these times. He said I can end you with the snap of a finger, but he just tell him do what he can. D'Angelo said just have a nice walk home. Next we get Ariana Grace versus Gigi Dolan. If Grace win, Dolan has to look. Dolan has to be more like her. Basically, means she got give Gigi. She don't give Gigi Dolan a makeover. Unfortunately, this one of those endings where like Ariana Grace keep. Doing dirty, low-headed tricks. Tricks. The one time, Gigi do something. She had a low blow. She gets the cue. <laughs> so now, we probably ain't going to get the gawky Gigi dolling no more. She got to get a makeover. So it might be like, oh, dogged up, kind of. I don't know how that's going to work. Next, we get Kiana James and Izzy Dane versus Thea Hill and Kehlani Jordan. Kehlani Jordan gets taken out. So basically, Thea Hill is by herself. But finally, her leg comes out to be her partner. Uh, basically, Jane hits the bankrupt for the win at 434. After the match, the hell basically says that uh, she's done being friends with Jane. Jane, the old dear hell is back and she run around the ring to the Chase You Fight song. <laughs> uh, Ridge Hall versus Sean Spears. Sean Spears gets the win here after a C4 onto the chair. At 10 minutes, Trick William comes out here. Basically, he said he wanted to shine my all because he wanted to be at Hayes' level. He said he didn't know that this trick was going to come out. He said he's been lying for a long time. Now they're going to have a match that stand and deliver. Metaphor comes out here. Darn, with Norm Darn. William tell him to stay out of this, but Darn said it's something they both lost something. I need to steal your heat. William said, last legend need to know that Williams has heat too. He basically macking on her. <laughs> the match is made for next week. They start to brawl. This is part with odd, so like <laughs> as he basically he basically is dominating everybody on metaphor. And then when last legend go around and like like try to punch him, he grab her. He basically kiss her and she like out. I hate when women get kissed and they do that whole little shaky thing like you like 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 it was like the best kiss like no like <laughs> and basically that's the end of NXT uh NXT all right let's get into my opinion the best show of the week this week AEW Dynamite Big Business so the show starts off with Renee Paquette backstage and a Mercedes Maybach pulls up we don't know who it is. She runs away because it didn't run to the car to interview them like most people usually do. Um, so from there, we get CEO on the board. Mercedes Monet makes her debut right at the beginning of the show. Comes out looking like a million bucks. Gold boots. Has CEO all in her hair and stuff like that. And design. She basically comes down and starts talking about um, how much she's missed being there. Um, the memories she's made there, especially since she was the first woman in the main event, um, a pay-per-view right there in Boston in that same building in the TD Garden. Um, she says she's looking forward to tearing it up with everyone backstage, um, including the two women in the main event. Uh, I said it took her some time, you know, to recover from the injury. Now she's back, though. She's all elite. And thanks to Tony Khan for tweeting out and announcing it. She does a lot of dancing from there. And um, that was basically it. You know what I'm saying? It was a nice start. Crowd was loving it. I thought she looked at like a million bucks. She's apparently paid a lot more than that, as we talked about in the news. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to see where this goes from there. Um, Samoa Joe comes out and promises to take out Wardlow, cutting a great promo. My favorite part of the end of the promo where he says, number two, Samoa Joe don't lose championships in the garden. Why he sounding like a reincarnated Red Arbok when he said the shit? <laughs> All he was was missing the fucking cigar and shit in his hand. Um, 
Uh, and I thought this was good, but for how the match turned out, I didn't think the match was that good. Uh, it didn't matter any, but I like the next promo part where Adam Cole basically was reading the story out of the book about how Wardlow had been cast aside from his time with MJF and how he's trying to rebuild himself to be a world champion and do the proper thing and hand him the title when he's done and the story, basically. He told us while sitting in a chair reading it like it was a book. Um, AEW World Title Match next. Samoa Joe taking on Wardlow. Wardlow still is not recovered from these instances that Adam Cole was talking about in the book, basically where he fell off and stuff like that, or the company didn't have as much shine on him, you know, I would say. Uh, there's a point in the match where Joe hit the no spot, so uh, Wardlow noticed it, faked it, still hit him with a uh, like a corkscrew, uh, almost like a whisper in the wind, but a big man doing the shit off the second rope in the Samoa Joe. He also faked the knee in order to um, set him up to take more damage at one point, um, scraping at the eyes. He went for that big knee off the top rope thing, which is put down everybody else he's hit. So Mojo's been the first one to tap out of it. Excuse me, tap out of it, excuse me, to, to kick out of it. Um, from there, uh, basically, Joe catches him in the coquina cut and taps him out 11 minutes and 4 seconds to retain his championship after avoiding a powerbomb symphony. Post-match, uh, Swerve comes down, taking out all type of security with a chain wrapped around his hand. Uh, can't get his hands on Joe. Joe Bill before that can happen. And as he's leaving, decides to kick one of the security off the side of the stage at the same time as he's leaving. So I thought that was pretty funny also. Uh, the leader up backstage next uh, with Alex Marvez. And they're asking about um, the situation with Pac and Eddie. And uh, pet to uh, Zero Mato. I like that uh, Nicholas is like, hey, don't you disrespect him like that. You use his full given name that's on his passport. The Rainmaker. Kajuska Okada. Oh, the Rainmaker's on his hat. He made him say the whole shit. So then Okada's like, hey, do you know today's Nicholas's birthday? You tell Nicholas happy birthday. So I asked Marvez, is like, oh, mm -hmm. happy birthday, Nicholas. He said, no. Sing it. So they go to break and start singing it. <laughs> it just emasculated them. So that was funny. <coughs> I love how they've used Okada so far. We get to see Okada's yeah. funny bones. So that's cool. Um, the Elite next take on Eddie Kingston, Penta, El Zero, Mato, and Pac. This was a great six man tag between the two, uh, between the six men, uh, and the two warring factions, I guess I would say. Great action here between the two. Pac looks excellent in his return here. Definitely setting up more of the feud, which I guess we're getting earlier than I thought. They're not going to wait to the pape. We're getting Eddie Kingston versus Okada for the singular Continental Crown. Not all three, just the Continental Crown next week on Dynamite. In this one, though, after more cheating and shenanigans by the Bucks, a lot of great sequences here, like, they had one chain spot where Petra came in, was going off, was getting um off a lot of bulldog shots. Hit one bulldog shot, looked up, caught a super kick right to his fucking face from Nicholas. So that was a sweet sequence there. Um, but basically the match ended up going down after Penn hit a Canadian destroyer, taking down Nick. There was a low blow behind the ref's back, it was led to a rainmaker by Okada on Kingston and finished him off. 12 minutes, 38 seconds. Usually don't like when heels just totally resort to Dick, uh, Dick Kick City, which has now been two, three weeks in a row. But I love these guys as heels, so I, I'll give leeway. I'm okay with it. So moving on from here, Tony Giovanni brings out Will Ospreay for a chat. Hold on, bruv! So Ospreay's out, says he spent years trying to be like uh, Brian Danielson, who's one of the best ever, after... Uh, Seeing the things that he does uh, hurt his body over the years. Asking Osprey, was it worth it? Uh, what happens when they face each other? He said, who's going to be the best wrestler uh, ever against the best wrestler in the world today? He was it worth it? you damn right it was worth it because I'm Will Osprey and I set the level out here, basically, is what he was saying. So, so it was a pretty fiery promo, good promo by him for sure. Down to Parazzo next challenges Mariah May and Tony Storm to a tag match next week. Uh, partner to be named soon. But she says, you better stay watching out for the shoot because I'm putting it up your ass. So, nice fire in her promo from there. Next, Jay White versus Darby Allen. This was a great match, but hard match to watch because I kept wincing watching Darby Allen's back. And he God damn, did he keep putting that motherfucker on the line during this match. At one point towards the end of the match, after I was already going for a coffin drop, they got reverted into a German suplex off the ropes, which is a pretty dope spot by uh, Jay White. Jay White baits him. He's hanging halfway in the ring, halfway off the apron. So Darby's like, shit, I'm going for another coffin drop. After all this damage, your back is taken, bro. Why? 
does it anyway. Jay moves, clips his fucking self, lays out there until you get to the ninth round, beats it, gets into the ring, right into a Blade Runner, boom, took out. Jay White wins this one 12 minutes, 15 seconds. Maybe the post-match might have been even better than the match, and the match was very good. Like I said, it kept me wincing for Darby the whole time we were watching it. As we said in the news, they pilmanized his leg. We'll get to how all of this happened. So, Bang Bang Scissor Gang came in like they were showing him sympathy. We're going to try to walk him out the ring. Instead, they turn around, they jump him, get ready to do the pilmanize. As that happens, the acclaimed music comes. They run down. Daddy ass, Billy Gunn gets in the ring, breaking it up, getting in Jay White's face like, the fuck are you doing? Like, hold on, don't do this. What are you doing? We're doing. The other two members of the Atlanta, Max Caster and Anthony Bones, are dragging Darby out the ring and up the ramp. They're going to go take him to get him help. Just enough time for Daddy Ass to turn his back. Jay White smacks him with the chair. So the end of that six man group, that shit's done now. So they start beating his ass. The funny part about it was. They hear this. They didn't see it. They just hear it. They hear him get smacked with the chair. Bowens and Caster just drop Darby. <laughs> drop him. Boop, right in the ground. Turn around like, what the fuck? And then run back to the ring. So they get beat up too. Bang, bang, scissor gang. Still pilmanizes his leg and then stand tall after the fact. Still pilmanizes his leg. Actually, it's shoot because he actually has a broken leg. We talked about in the news. So uh, we're going to see what happens with these faxes moving forward. But. This is what happened so far. Um, next up from here, we get Hook and Chris Jericho versus the Gates of Agony. This was a bad match. It wasn't a bad match for the participants. It's just that a lot of stuff, as we've been saying recently, that Jericho's been involved with hasn't been that good. Uh, Hook took on the bulk of this match, and he looked it pretty good, I will say, hitting off many Northern Life suplexes and Germans during the match. Eventually, this one came down to a red one. Walls combination put on Bishop Khan. Getting hit with two finishers from misses. You can't kick out of that. He went that day. He ends up tapping eight minutes, 43 seconds. Next up, Kyle Roddy's backstage. He's talking about how banged up he's been and how he's healed up. But his injuries were to the point where he couldn't even pick up his own baby. So he was extremely messed up. Glad to see him back in the ring. Since he's been looking at the great roster AEW he's been having. And he says next week in collision, he'll be ready to take on Brian Keith. As he's preparing to you know end his promo here. Kyle! The Undisputed Kingdom walk in. Um, just saying they're cool when he has to fight on his own is giving him some props. And as he's walking off, he's kind of lamenting the situation in his head like, yeah, now I'm on my own. Next up, this is something I wish they would do more in AEW that WWE used to do a lot back in the day. And they kind of still do too. Say there's a world title match on Raw. Do you ever notice where they'll show the participants of the match like warming up in their whatever spots that they're in, no matter if be men or women, prior to the match starting? AEW did that this week with Riho. Also led to the fact that uh, Miss Monet was there because she stepped in to wish her good luck on her upcoming main event match against Willow Nightingale. And you already know the history between um, the CEO and Willow Nightingale. Our main event is Riho versus Willow Nightingale. So we can't play our favorite game this week because Ladies Act got number one. No, they got the main event. And he got time. Nine minutes, 28 seconds in this match. It was a pretty good match. It was basically was putting real speed against Willow Nightingale's power. Um, eventually, the power won out. There were many great spots in this one. I like the pounce that uh, Rio took the knocker to the outside. Also, like the dragon suplex that she gave Willow Nightingale on the apron. That was also a crucial spot. And I like seeing Willow Nightingale go all Cactus Jack. She didn't do the flying elbow off the apron, but she did do a flip drop on her back because she totally didn't land on Rio off the apron. She was putting herself through it in this one. Eventually, she wins this one. Um, uh, with the babe with the power bomb at uh, nine minutes and twenty eight seconds, I pick up the victory here over Rio, um, setting her up more. Post match lights go out, come back on. Julia Hart's there, uh, for the distraction this time. Sky Blue runs in, starts taking out, um, Willow Nightingale until Mercedes Bonet comes in to make the save, takes out Julia Hart. Uh, I, I'm not sure the name of the move now. Uh, I don't think it, well, obviously what a bank statement, because that's a submission, but she has some type of move, her new finisher, I guess, on, uh, Sky Blue once she was in the ring, actually it was on Julia Hart in the ring, I do believe, running both of them off, uh, she gives Willow Nightingale a hug, and then Willow Nightingale gives her the ring so she can end the show dancing to CEO as the show goes to black, and that was the end of AEW Big Business. All right, uh, let's smack down real quick. You run through that quick, I'll run through Rampage even quicker. Uh... <laughs> Legato Del Fantasma defeated LWO. Oh, with a uh, pop-up soccer kick. So Del Fantasma advanced to the qualifier 
for the uh, six pack match at forty. Uh, LA Knight and AJ Styles officially became it, it officially set for WrestleMania forty after AJ Styles basically cracked him in the back, cracked him in the back with a chair. Uh, Jimmy also accepted Jay uh, WrestleMania challenge. Uh, Randy Orton defeated Grayson Waller at him in the RKO. Uh, Logan Paul tried to attack them, but that backfired because uh, Kevin Owens came out there, which led to a match. Nice spot where Kevin Owens basically stunned him into an RKO, and Logan Paul had to defend his title in a triple threat match. Uh, Ned Santo Escobar defeated uh, <laughs> Dragon Lee via pinfall. Rey Mysterio basically came back and challenged Escobar to a match one on one. Uh, Bailey defeated uh, Dakota Kai via disqualification. After being attacked by Damage Control, Naomi tried to make the save, but she got overwhelmed by the numbers. Uh, the main thing basically was the Rock concert. He kicked off WrestleMania 40. Uh, just some of the insults. Basically, he said Dusty Young's son was just what he feared. He tried to raise him right, but he turned out too weird. That's when Dusty said with total frustration that the drugs and cheap condoms were a bad combination. Uh, he also threw shots at John Morant. <laughs> John Morant. Uh, he said the Rock listed the name of not only Dusty Rose, but also Cody's mother. Mother, basically, and then he ended up prom by saying that he's going to present her with the belt soaked in her son's blood at WrestleMania. He basically said, the Rock's going to take this belt, and he's going to beat your son. He's going to beat the piss out your son. He's going to make your son bleed. He's going to tear his skin, tear his flesh, and he's going to flesh. He's going to whoop him. He's going to whoop him like a dog over and over again. Then he said, I'm going to pull you to the side and say, Mama Rose, your son's blood is going to be on this belt. <laughs> on this belt. Basically, <laughs> basically, uh, and that basically was the crust of SmackDown. I said SmackDown was kind of was bad this week because The Rock basically took over. Also, the Dragon Lee match got cut for time because The Rock concert went over <laughs> again, <laughs> again. But that's the end of SmackDown, though. All right, and our final show of this week is we short on time. AEW Rampage. First match was the best friends, Orange Cassidy and Trapperetta, taking on Dark Order, John Silver, and Evil Uno. In this one, the match comes down to a nice spot where Silver and Uno combine for some excellent combo signature moves as Cassidy stops the pin attempt. Silver and Cassidy are now going at it. All of a sudden, Cassidy catches him with an orange punch, which sends him into Trent, which sets him up for the strong zero. And as uh, Uva Uno tries to get into the ring to make the save, he catches the orange punch himself. So, best friends win after nine minutes. That led to the victory there. Second match on the show, uh, Squash, what you got in the time? Mm. It's Rampage. I'm going to tell you participants. I'm going to go. Ryan May and Tony Storm versus Jobbers. A minute. And five. Two. Even. Damn. Two even. Damn. Squash match. Ryan May did all the work. Uh, Tony Storm finished her off. Uh, uh, you know, with the hip attack. Um, Ryan May uh, hit a power, hit her power driver. <laughs> Tony Storm power driver and then pinned her for the victory. Uh, post match, Ronald Parazzo, uh comes out, reveals her partner, Thunder Rosa. They run them off, so that's who the tag match is gonna be. The next match, uh, Commander taking on Kateshka. Uh, match went a little longer than I expected, went six minutes, but Kateshka picks up the victory here, hits a power bar after it, and they uh, kicked the face, followed by spinning Falcon Arrow for the victory. Uh, he looked damn good in doing it also. So more more um, for his momentum. And our final match of the show, the main event was Judge Peter King was Rodney, uh, Roderick Strong and the Kingdom. Rodney. I'm going to say Rodney, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Roger Strong and the Kingdom taking on top flight. And your boy with his hydro homies. Action Andre. Oh, God. He back drinking water in one go? Thank God he did not. I was so happy this didn't happen. This is a pretty good match of the high flyers taking on more of the technical um, compadres, I guess I'll call them. This one ends with a hint of heartache after Action Andretti, Action Andretti becomes a victim of the spike power driver for the victory for the Undisputed Kingdom after about 11 minutes. This is a pretty good episode of Rampage, though I did go through it pretty fast. There was four, but it was a lot of good acting here also. So, 
I'll say that. And with that, we will also say and bid you adieu and good night. Like my homie, Kenny Omega. Good night. Bang. Send it home with Ron Simmons for myself and I'm Clint. This has been Hot Tag Wrestle Corner. Send us home.